I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, Yahweh Sagano, I'm glad that you are well and we are gathered here together today. Um, I have the privilege of introducing to you Catherine Foreman Gray. Catherine Foreman Gray is a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. She is a graduate at the University of Arkansas and has been employed as a history and preservation officer for the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma for over 10 years. Previously, she worked as an archivist for the Cherokee Nation Cultural Tourism Department and as a, and as a former park ranger for the Fort Smith National Historic Site in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And those of us from Northeast Oklahoma um, know about the um, importance of Fort Smith and its relation to the tribes in Eastern Oklahoma, including my own. Um, Catherine was born in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, which is the capital of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, she was raised on her great-grandmother's Cherokee allotment in Muskogee County, Oklahoma. She's been a speaker at numerous conferences and events where she enjoys presenting on the outlaw and lawman history of the Cherokee Nation and Indian Territory. Ms. Foreman Gray um, also serves as one of the tribal historians on the Cherokee Nation's Advisory Committee on History and Culture. She also serves on the board of directors for the U.S. Marshals Museum in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and as the official representative for the Intertribal Council of the Five Civilized Tribes and for the Three Rivers Museum in Muskogee, Oklahoma. She currently consults with museums and institutions across the nation on exhibits and video production relating to the history of the Cherokee Nation, the five tribes, and Indian Territory. And with that, I will turn the time over to Catherine Foreman Gray. Hello, everyone. My name is Catherine Foreman Gray, and thank you for that introduction. So, yes, I am not one of the elected leaders that's here today, so you guys are going to get a little bit of a history presentation because that's what I do. <laughs> and so, um, when I started thinking about doing a presentation on our history in this area, one of the things when I started pulling everything, it's um, you all know a lot of our history here that we don't know. So this is my first time to West Virginia. Um, it's a beautiful country. I can definitely see why the Europeans wanted this, why it was prized for its hunting grounds. I know we've had a little bit of discussion on um, those overlapping boundaries. And I do have a map here that'll show you um, as well for the, for the Cherokee Nation our, you know, we claim this area as well as a lot of Kentucky as far as our historical hunting grounds. But those areas are also claimed by a lot of other tribes as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to focus on is not just our history here, but also how, where we are now, what we're doing today in Oklahoma. There's a lot of people that don't know what happened to the Cherokee people. They, sometimes I think they just, they think we went west and then what happened to them? You know, I, I was down in Georgia a few years ago checking out of a hotel and I had a backpack on and this guy behind me, it had the Cherokee Nation seal on it. And this guy behind me was like, Cherokee Nation, I didn't know you guys existed anymore. And so, um, you know, that's Georgia for you too. We don't have the best history with them. So, um, but it's just, you know, people, people don't realize Oklahoma today, you know, we have 39 federally recognized tribes in the state of Oklahoma. And, um, you know, they were removing natives there because they didn't want the land. And then what happens later is, you know, there's, there's first there's gold and then there's, you know, oil. So you got liquid gold. And so here we go again, everybody starts coming west and, and wanting more of our lands. And so I will go through a little bit of our history with the Cherokee Nation, but then I also want to talk about the resilience of the Cherokee Nation and just how we have overcome and persevered and as have a lot of the tribal nations in the state of Oklahoma. Um, we historically were one of the largest tribal nations. Let me get my, here we go. I'll start with my little, my little PowerPoint that I, that I brought. 
Um, so we are one of only three federally recognized tribes in, that are recognized in the United States. The other two are the United Kituwa Band of Cherokee Indians, which are also headquartered in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, as well as the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, who are our brothers out and sisters out in uh, Cherokee, North Carolina. So you guys are a little bit closer to them um, being out here. We are a sovereign tribal government. We encompass all or part of 14 counties in northeastern Oklahoma. So you can see our map right here. And, and again, this is the northeastern part of Oklahoma. And if you've ever been there, um, I think when people have this vision of Oklahoma, they always just think it's flat. Uh, we are at the foothills of the Ozarks. And so it's beautiful country if you ever get a chance. If you've never been to northeastern Oklahoma, um, it's a beautiful country and you know, it's, it's very reminiscent. The hills aren't as big as they are, you know, back east, but I feel like we did get some of the best parts of Oklahoma. So we have a little over 450,000 citizens now. Uh, we're huge. We were historically one of the largest tribes um, before the smallpox epidemics, before the wars. Um, you know, by, by the end of the 1700s, our population was less than 10, Ten, less than 10,000 at one point. And so, you know, we've, we've worked to rebuild ourselves over the years, but we now have over 450,000 citizens and about half of these reside uh, within the state of Oklahoma. So this is a map, give you a little bit of idea of um, our ancestral homelands that we claim as the Cherokee people. The areas of Kentucky, let me get my little pointer here. This little, I don't think it's gonna work on this. The areas of Kentucky, um, a little bit of West Virginia, and then Virginia, these are claimed as, as some of our, our ancestral uh, hunting grounds. And one of the things when you look at documentation from Europeans, they talk about this vast area that the natives weren't using. We were using it, we just weren't abusing the land. And so, um, you know, again, this is claimed by a lot of different tribes, uh, you know, Delaware, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other the other tribes. But this right here was held, this is our some of our Cherokee towns that we have in this area. Um, our land was communally held, so the entire tribe controlled this. There would have been hundreds of these towns that were scattered throughout the southeast. Uh, we had approximately 81 million acres. Again, these would become states of Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia. Again, we would have hundreds of these towns and villages. They would have been scattered throughout the present day US. Uh, these were all autonomous. They all had their own chiefs. We didn't move towards a centralized uh, political structure until the early 1800s. Um, all of our towns were tied by a matrilineal clan system, um, our ceremonial structures, our language. And again, these all functioned independently of each other. And it's estimated that at the time of European contact, which is 1540 for the Cherokee, this is when Hernando de Soto will come through. And this is the first documented contact between Cherokees and Europeans. And they say that it was approximately 25 to 30,000 Cherokees who lived in this area at the time. And you can see that the out towns, the overhill towns, the overhill towns, those are the ones, those individuals were the ones that were coming over and active here in this West Virginia area, to my understanding. So we do have a matrilineal clan system is how we are organized. I know sometimes when you go out west and you're familiar with some of the Plains tribes, they have a patrilineal. Well, a lot of the eastern tribes are a matrilineal uh, clan system. So we get our clan from our mother. I am bird clan. I feel very fortunate to still have my clan. It's something that can be easily lost. Uh, my mother is, is bird clan. My grandmother, who was a, a Cherokee, a first language Cherokee speaker, a full blood, and she was bird clan. And it just follows that matrilineal kinship line. Um, I do have three boys, and so I'm able to pass that clan down to them. So they are also bird clan, but they are unable to pass that down themselves. So unless my children, my boys, uh, marry a Cherokee girl that has her clan as well, then my grandchildren will be clanless. So each clan, these are some, these are our, our seven clans that we have. They do say that we had roughly 12 to 14 clans. We have a migration story. These aren't our ancestral homelands according to some historians. So we have a migration story that talks about Cherokees coming from an island in the south, 
that was surrounded by undrinkable water. The island began to tremble, shake, spew fire, and Cherokees embarked north um, on canoes and roughly 12 to 14 clans at that time. We reach a place here in North America, and uh, this is when we ended up with the seven clans, which we have today, which are Wolf, Blue Clan, sometimes referred to as Bear Clan, Long Hair, sometimes referred to as Twister, Paint, Bird, Deer, and Wild Potato, or Blind, blind Savannah. All of our clans are equal, and none are superior to or more important than the others. And each of these clans had specific roles and responsibilities um, to each other. Um, the, the migration story is something that's interesting, I feel like, in our history, because it's not something that all three tribes agree on when it comes to the Cherokees. So when I spend some time in the Eastern Band, it's not something that they acknowledge or talk about. But as Cherokees, at least in Oklahoma, we do acknowledge that story. It was something that was recorded by James Mooney. Uh, there's a book out that's called Myths of the Cherokees, and he was an American ethnographer that spent a lot of time with the Cherokee people. And he talks about this story. But again, it's not something that the Eastern Band uh, will talk about. So it just goes to so, show some of the differences between the tribes. So these is, this is a land session map of the, of the Cherokee people. Uh, the one I've circled, number four, and a little bit of five right there, these were land sessions that happened in 1768 and also 1770. And these were the lands that we had here in West Virginia, and I just wanted to kind of throw this map up there so that way everybody had an idea on uh, when we ceded the lands here in West Virginia through two separate treaties. So a little bit about our political history. So between 1721 and 1783, we had over 42 million acres of Cherokee lands that would later become Georgia, Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, and Tennessee. These were all ceded um, to the British from the, from the Cherokee. So this shows that before the United States even came into an in existence, we had a treaty relationship with the British government. Now, treaties are something that are made between sovereign nations, between governments. These are not made between groups of people, organizations, or anything like that. These are treaties that are made between sovereign nations at this time. We hold 11 treaties with the United States. Um, these started in 1785 up to 1819. 1819 is when we will stop making treaties and we are going to cede no more land. So um, there were vast amounts of lands that started you know, after the Revolutionary War, which we sided with the British. A lot of people don't know that Cherokee sided with the British during the Revolution. And I love to remind my, my family of that every year when they're wearing their, you know, waving their American flag. So I'm always in my Merciless Indian Savages t-shirt, which is how we're referred to in the Declaration of Independence. Um, so in 1819, we are going to stop making treaties. It becomes tribal law. And if you do make a treaty that's going to cede any land, uh, the ex execution would be your punishment. And so um, it becomes something that becomes divisive for the Cherokee people. Our history is, is, is complex and um, one of the things I always say is that the federal government was great at dividing us as a people sometimes. Uh, we start moving from an autonomous leadership in each town to a national government. And again, it's going to be illegal for a person to sign any land session treaties. So um, President Deborah Dotson, she from the Delaware Nation, she mentioned about the uh, the treaty that the Delaware Nation has. And so I did want to uh, touch on this a little bit too. We do have this uh, provision in a treaty with the United States as well to send a deputy or delegate to Congress. I know there's been a lot of um, uh, information in the news about this delegate to Congress. Ours is Kimberly Teehee that we are trying to seat. And this is the first time uh, Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin Jr., he's um, He's the first chief that has actually looked into seating a delegate for the Cherokee Nation. We've always had this right, but this is the first time in our history that we have actually tried to seat a delegate in the House of Representatives. So I have to put this guy up here. He's one of our most famous Cherokees. I always say that Sequoia, Will Rogers, and the late uh, Wilma Mankiller are probably our three most famous Cherokees that we have. Um, we have, a, he, he develops the syllabary, which makes us, um, when Cherokees, fluent speakers that would learn how to 
all they had to do was memorize the syllabary, which was 86 characters that he devised. And they all have a, their own unique uh, sound, uh, the syllables do, or the, the syllabic writing system is what it is. It's not an alphabet, but it's a syllabic writing system. And uh, if you already spoke the Cherokee language, all you had to do was memorize these, these characters. And they say within two to three weeks that Cherokees who could speak the language also knew how to read and write in the Cherokee language. And so by the year 1824, they say roughly 75% of Cherokees were literate. Um, he is a genius. He is one of our, uh, you know, we love Sequoia back home. You know, there's, a, there's a lot of information on him. We have a museum that's dedicated to him uh, just outside of Sal Salisaw, Oklahoma. And so um, he, he is the genius for us uh, in the Cherokee Nation and, and we definitely revere him. This also prompts the establishment of a Cherokee constitution for us in 1827. So this is us starting to move towards that centralized government, which was actually opposed by a lot of the traditional Cherokees who opposed um, you know, moving towards the centralized government structure and not the separate town structures and, and the chiefs that would have been scattered throughout the Southeast. The syllabary will also prompt the Cherokee Phoenix newspaper. Uh, a lot of people might be familiar with this today as well because it's still in existence. This became the first Native American and bilingual newspaper in the United States. Um, and again, it's still in, in print today. So this is a story that many people are familiar with when it comes to the Cherokee Nation. Um, I always, when, when we receive calls or emails or people approach us at Cherokee Nation, it's, I feel like 80% of the time it's about removal. It's about ancestors on the Trail of Tears. Um, it's, it's always about removal. And while this is definitely an important part of our history that we cannot forget, I, I don't like a see, to see us as victims all of the time because I feel like that's what it kind of does to us. And to me, you know, we did lose about a quarter of our tribe. They say roughly two to 4,000 people that died on these routes. Um, a lot of them died during um, encampment when they were put into the camps before they were even removed. Uh, this is a very devastating event uh, for us to be removed from our homelands back here east. All of this happens in 1838 and 1839. And when you look at the length of some of these journeys that our ancestors are dealing with, leaving in early September and not arriving until March and undergoing um, you know, the sickness that happened in the camps, um, the, the, the weather, uh, you know, was some of the harshest winters. There was drought uh, that happened during the roundup because these, these people had already been in these camps for months. We were rounded up in March of 1838, and most of our people were not actually sent west until September, October, November uh, later that year. So there was a lot of people who sat in the camps and became very sick. Uh, you have the government who's providing us uh, foods. A lot of the times those supplies were spoiled. And so um, it, it's, it's heart-wrenching when you start researching just how many people profit off removal too. And so, um, and again, it's, a, it's definitely an important part of our history. We come back and, you know, and commemorate this. And we, next week we have the annual Trail of Tears conference that will happen in West Salem Springs, Oklahoma. And this is something that throughout all of these states that you see us being removed through Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, they all have state chapters. And so every year we will work to rotate and uh, visit some of these different sites um, that our ancestors traveled during removal. So we get asked a lot about this guy too, right? So um, why did the Cherokees support Andrew Jackson? So he was a friend of the Cherokees initially. And, um, you know, we supported him during the War of 1812, uh, the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, and we are bound by treaty at this point. So after the Revolutionary War, we signed that first treaty with the United States. Um, I, you know, when we had those treaties with the British, we were obligated to fight with the British against the, the colonists. And then after the devastation of the American Revolutionary War for the Cherokees, uh, we signed treaties with the United States government, which again puts us under the protection of the United States government, but then we are also bound to, um, to fight alongside them if needed. 
Uh, we do save this man's life at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Jenaluska is the, the Cherokee that is stated to have saved his life, and he later supposedly states that had he known what Jackson was going to do, you know, he would have let him die out there. Uh, within a month of Jackson's election, he signs the 1830 Indian Removal Act. Um, he favored Indian removal, you know, from its conception as federal policy. And as president, he's the one that would openly defy the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, everyone here is maybe familiar with the, the, you know, Worcester versus Georgia, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. Uh, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. Uh, this is supposedly it's said by Andrew Jackson when Marshall had ruled in favor of the Cherokees. So I mentioned these guys because after removal, um, when we were removed to Indian Territory, things just got worse for us initially. Uh, we have what's called the Cherokee Civil War, not to be confused with the American Civil War, but we were fighting with each other. Um, there were deaths that happened, hundreds and hundreds of deaths that happened between uh, what we call the Ross Party and the Treaty Party. So we do have these men who sign an illegal treaty. There's actually about, there's over 30 men, including one of my, he's my fourth great grandfather. His name was James Starr Sr. He will also sign this Treaty of New Echota. And what it does is relinquish all of our homelands here in the East. It was an illegal treaty that was signed by a small faction of Cherokees. And again, it cedes all lands in the East for lands in the West. Uh, these men will die, uh, except for Stan Wadey. He somehow is able to escape being killed. But Major Ridge, John Ridge, and Elias Foodnot, they are all executed, assassinated, murdered, um, however you want to look at that legal definition of it. But they are all killed June 22nd of 1839, just a few months after the last detachment arrives in Indian Territory. And again, this will spark what's called the Cherokee Civil War for us back home. We don't resolve this until 1846. We finally sign a treaty, everybody is granted amnesty, and we are finally going to start being able to really rebuild. So removal became very divisive because there were people who, the terrorizing that was happening, especially in the state of Georgia, uh, the Georgia militia, the land lotteries that were happening, Georgia was extending its laws over Cherokees who were residing um, in the north part of Georgia. It became illegal for Cherokees to mine gold on our own lands. We couldn't meet in council. Uh, we couldn't testify in court. And so we ended up having to actually move our capital across the state line into Tennessee. So Red Clay is our last capital in the east, right there outside of, uh, of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so these men will go and sign an illegal treaty because they felt like removal was inevitable and we needed to just take the best deal that we can get. This is still an issue, not an issue, but this is something we still love to debate today as Cherokees. Um, many of us descend from both Treaty Party and Ross Party. And when I say Ross Party, I'm, I'm referring to Principal Chief John Ross. He is our longest serving Principal Chief. Over 38 years he served as Principal Chief and he died in 1866, um, just at the end of the Civil War. And again, I, I don't know that I can stress just how devastating these events were for us after removal. And so it's going to be 1846 until Cherokees are able, able to finally start moving on and rebuilding in Indian territory. And then we'll enter what's called the golden era or the golden age of the Cherokee people throughout the 1850s. This is when you're going to see a lot of our structures that are being rebuilt. We're going to reestablish our schools, our government. Um, and then what happens? The American Civil War starts in 1861, and we become completely abandoned by the federal government uh, out in Indian Territory, and what that does is allow the Confederacy uh, to come in. A lot of the tribal nations at this time were trying to stay neutral during the American Civil War, but again, it becomes a divisive issue for us. And for us as Cherokees, it was really just opening these wounds once again, because this man that you see here, Stan Wadey, he starts, um, uh, he, he he gets his own regiment together and, and starts fighting on, on the side of the Confederacy when we're trying to remain neutral. So again, it becomes a, um, a very divisive issue for us um, during the 1860s. 
And then finally, we start rebuilding ourselves again after the American Civil War. A lot of people don't realize that the Amer American Civil War was actually more devastating to the Cherokees economically, the amount of death, than the removal was for us. Um, we do start rebuilding ourselves in Indian Territory once again. Um, we start constructing courthouses throughout the Cherokee Nation. We actually have one left. It's the Saline Courthouse. Um, this is the oldest government building in the state of Oklahoma. This is the Cherokee National Supreme Court building. It's now a museum. And um, we still operate under the same system of checks and balances today. We also had uh, the only prison in Indian Territory. There were a lot of jails, but we were one of the first tribes to start trying to rehabilitate our um, are you know, people who had committed any crimes. And so this was the only one that existed from 1875 till 1901. This is a, uh, the Cherokee National um, Prison Museum today. We have this as a, as a museum in downtown Tahlequah. We also reestablish our newspaper. And so it functioned on and off, especially during the American Civil War. Sometimes there would be lack of funds for it. Um, and then it was called the, the Indian Advocate whenever we moved to, <clears throat> to Indian Territory. And it's renamed again today as far, um, you know, referring back to its original name as the Cherokee Phoenix newspaper. So what I really wanted to focus on is what we do today in the state of Oklahoma. So that was just a little bit of a brief history on, on the Cherokees, you know, back east and how we get to the state of Oklahoma. Uh, we have what's called allotment in Oklahoma, the push for Oklahoma statehood that happens. Um, as it's mentioned in my bio, I, um, I was a former park ranger at the Fort Smith National Historic Site. That federal court, if you've ever watched the movie True, True Grit or, or, or you're familiar with Judge Parker, that was a very unique jurisdiction that was unlike any other in the country. That court in Fort Smith, ha Fort Smith had jurisdiction over all natives in Indian Territory when any crimes were committed by or against a non-native. And so um, it, it becomes this push for Oklahoma statehood starts to happen when all of these intruders start coming into Indian Territory. We've heard the land runs, you know, we've seen movies about the land runs. Um, this push for Oklahoma statehood really happens when all of these intruders are let in. Um, you know, with the railroads that start coming into Indian Territory, which a lot of the tribes had fought against. So we have allotment. Um, it, Oklahoma becomes a state in 1907. <clears throat> this is also very devastating <clears throat> for many of the tribal nations as well. They say within 10 years that 90% of Cherokee lands were out of Cherokee hands. I think we have less than 2% of those lands today that are still with some of the same families in the, in the state of Oklahoma. And so I feel very fortunate that I was able to grow up on my, and we still have that land today of my great grandmother's. It was allotted to her when she was two years old. And um, we still retain that. And she died in 1975. And we still retain that land um, today. <clears throat> so after allotment, we also have, um, you know, we're all familiar with that book that's coming out, Killers of the Flower Moon, that's, be adapt that's uh, being adapted into a movie right now. A lot of the tribal nations in Oklahoma have some of that same type of history. This land grab in Oklahoma becomes very devastating for the tribes. Um, you know, we, we um, also have, um, you know, the depression that happens in the 1930s. There's relocation that happens of a lot of natives out of Oklahoma from these rural communities. Uh, this is why we have so many Cherokees that live out in the states of California, um, Arizona, down in Texas, um, because they start relocating native families to these urban, in, uh, these urban areas, um, some of these larger cities. Um, so today what we do, though, we do everything that the federal government does except print money and raise an army. Uh, we serve our citizens with health care, housing, education, and other social services. Um, we also have a tax commission that levies state taxes on goods and services sold within Cherokee Nation, such as our car tags. So we compact with the state to have our own car tags, as do a lot of the tribal nations in the state of Oklahoma. We have a $3 billion plus impact on uh, the state of Oklahoma. We employ over 15,000 people in Northeast Oklahoma, and our indirect employment is over 25,000 uh, people. 
We do run the largest health, tribal health care system in the United States with 11 clinics, a hospital, um, and more than a million patient visits a year. We have 450,000 citizens. So not all of them live in the state of Oklahoma. About half of them do. But we have a lot that are along the borders, Arkansas, Missouri, Kansas, Texas. And a lot of these people will come into the state of Oklahoma and use our uh, tribal health services. And so we're not only servicing Cherokees that are living in the state of Oklahoma, but we're also servicing all of the ones in the surrounding areas, which are, are fairly large. I think we have roughly 15 to 20,000 Cherokees that live just on that western border there in Arkansas. We give roughly four to five million annu annually to, um, to schools, and all of this money comes from our, our car tags. And again, we have repaired and replaced more than thousands of miles of roads and bridges in the state of Oklahoma. We help with you know, tornado sirens if the community needs it. We're donating cars for police, you know, if, a, if a, you know, a department needs it, a police department. So there's a lot that the tribes do in the state of Oklahoma that the government of the state of Oklahoma doesn't do. I always say that if it wasn't for the tribal nations that Oklahoma would go completely bankrupt because there are a lot of times that the tribes are the ones that are filling in the gaps um, when the state of Oklahoma is not able to. <laughs> and we're more than casinos. And you know, I think when people think of native tribes today, they think of casinos, right? That's one of the first things I think people think of. Oh yeah, I love your casino. I mean, I can say I'm Cherokee and most of the time that's one of the things that I'm going to hear. We do have gaming and hospitality, but we hold a lot of federal con contracts as well with the federal government. And this money brings in, I mean, it's not comparable to the casinos, but it's actually a substantial amount of money that we do. Um, that we do bring in from federal contracting. Uh, we have what's called Cherokee Federal. Uh, we have Cherokee Nation Industries. Uh, we have our own, um, we have our own television show that's actually just recently been uh, broadcast um, nationally now. It'll be on PBS in, in every market. And so there's a lot that the tribe does outside of gaming. Now we do use a lot of those resources from gaming to pour back into healthcare. We don't do any kind of per capita. We don't get any you know, monthly check or, or yearly check or anything like that. Uh, our, our students for the most part usually get 2,500 to 3,000 a semester to go to school. And that's all of our tribal citizens. And that, that's not just the ones that reside in the state of Oklahoma. So every college student will get at least 2,500 a semester to go to school. Um, our healthcare facilities, our clothing vouchers, um, hunting and fishing licenses. I mean, there's a lot that, uh, that we do with that gaming revenue. Aerospace, environmental construction, telecommunications. Again, we have a, a fairly large portfolio. And so really what I wanted to mention again is the resilience and perseverance, not only of the Cherokee Nation, but of all the tribal nations in Oklahoma. Um, there's a lot that the tribal nations in Oklahoma have endured. Uh, a lot of us were removed to Indian territory because nobody wanted that land. And that's, that's the way it always goes, right? They are always you know, pushing natives west to areas that they don't want. And then once they start moving west, they, you know, they want those resources as well. And so it's, um, you know, I, I want to say thanks, you know, especially to the other tribal nations that are here today. And, um, you know, we all have our issues sometimes, but for the most part, I feel like we do try to work together. And one of the things that we've realized is that we are much stronger together as tribal nations when we, when we work together. Um, you know, versus trying to independently do this. Uh, our tribe is part of the five civilized tribes, the Intertribal Council. Uh, we get that term civilized because obviously we were uh, assimilating more so than some of the other tribal nations um, when we were back east. A lot of that is to hold on to our lands. That's really what this push were, was for us, especially during the early 1800s. We start allowing missionaries to come in. We don't want our children converted to, um, you know, converted as Christians. We want those missionaries to educate our children how to read and write in, in, in English because we knew that, you know, the colonists, the Americans weren't going anywhere. Um, but yeah, I just want to uh, say thank you all for, for having me today here at West Virginia University. And again, it's my first time to be here and it's so beautiful here. So I, um, I look forward to exploring the town a little bit more as well. So does, does anyone have any questions or anything?
Okay. Thank you. So we had a couple questions in the chat about accessing the slides and presentation. And just so you know, they will be available. I believe you said via the WVU library. The Zoom recording will be available afterwards. Yeah, so you can access that via the recording. And then we also have a question about the congressional delegate. So who decides if a delegate is seated? in Congress? And then also, would the delegate have voting power if seated? So all of this has to be initiated through the House of Representatives. Um, they don't have voting power, but they definitely have influence in, in the committees. And I'm sure if there's any of my other tribal le leaders here, make sure that I'm saying this correctly. But no, we don't have voting power, but there's definitely influence that you can have in those, com those committee meetings when, when you're a part of that. Does that sound correct? So I, I was going to say that um, Principal Chief Hoskins made a, a beautiful plea towards seating the Cherokee delegate in Congress, and it's available online. You can Google it and find it, and it's, it's um, stunning oratory, I think. And you've probably oh, watched yes. it as well, and maybe you'd agree with that, that he makes a very clear point about what was agreed upon and that that agreement should be honored. Yes, there is a website that's out there. I think it's called CherokeeDelegate.com. But again, you can, I'm not 100% sure on that, but you can Google um, Cherokee Delegate and there's, we actually have a website that's dedicated to educating people on um, the history of delegations, uh, just historically how we were, you know, initially with the British, later with the United States, and then those promises that were made in those treaties to, again, not just the Cherokees, but other tribal nations as well. I have a couple of questions I'll ask you, and we may have some more questions emerge from the audience, but um, I can remember several years ago being in Cherokee, North Carolina for a gathering and and getting an understanding from that, um, from some of the discussions taking place there, that there was an agreement or a conciliation that occurred between the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and Cherokee Nation regarding a few aspects. Do you, do you want to speak at all to... Um, relations between those who stayed east and those who who went out to Indian Territory and, and are in Oklahoma today? Anything that you want to comment on about how, Just the, how the Eastern Band came to be, basically, it, and yeah, how maybe, we work with them today? If you would, that would be great. Yeah. So um, many here, how, well, how far are you guys from Cherokee, North Carolina here? About seven hours. About seven hours. Drive. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're, for the most part, a lot of them did accept land reserves. And so... Um, and some of, the, some of the people in the Eastern Band were doing this to hold on to some of our oldest Cherokee towns as well. Uh, there are a few that would flee up into the mountains if you've, you know, just like it is here, it's very rugged country if you, if you go up into the Smoky Mountains. So there were a few that would flee up into the mountains um, for the most part, and, that, and that's where the Army didn't want to go. So for the most part, a lot of the Cherokees specifically, um, a lot of them in North Georgia, you know, Northeast Alabama, southern part of Tennessee, most all of those Cherokees were rounded up except those who were able to, to flee or who had accepted land reserves. When they accepted those land reserves, they were made citizens of the state of North Carolina, um, also the United States. But again, they were not able to hold on to that land for very long. It was a short-lived promise um, to the Cherokees who stayed east. And so for the, for the most part, the majority of us are rounded up or removed west. We do have documentation where some of those Cherokees who were removed west actually left and came right back to, to the east afterwards. Um, and then there are also people who start removing west as late as the 1870s and the 1880s um, who, would, who would come west. And so we do have a relationship with the Eastern Band today as well as the United Ketua Band of Cherokee Indians who are in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, we have tri-council meetings every year. We have Gadua celebration, uh, our, our mother town. It's called Katua or Gadua. You can say it either way. And, um, and so we do have these annual celebrations. There's also a language consortium. So we're always coming up with new words in the Cherokee language. Cherokee language is a very descriptive language. And one that I want to point out that we are surrounded by people in the Southeast that have a Muscogean dialect. Uh, we have an Iroquoian, and so, um, you know, we are the one, one of the only ones in the Southeast that have that Iroquoian dialect, so our language is a lot different 
than some of our neighbors. But we meet every six months, every year. I'm trying to, I don't know exactly how often that language consortium is, but we get all of our speakers together. They will meet. Um, they will help come up with new words because we have a, we're pouring a, an obscene amount of money into language revitalization right now. We have less than 2,000 fluent first language speakers that are still left. And the majority of those are over the age of you know, 55 or 60. So we're losing speakers every day. So we've really focused on our youth. Uh, we have immersion programs going on where we take our elders and our youth and um, they work together to, to create new speakers. I'm a perfect example of use it or lose it. I grew up in a household where my grandmother, she raised me. She's a first language uh, fluent speaker. And it's, it's something that's easy to lose if you don't use it every day. On my college transcript, it says Cherokee language is my foreign language. And it's still something that I struggle with um, every day trying to trying to learn because if you're not using it all the time, it's it's so easy to use. So those are just some of the programs that we do with the Eastern Band. Again, there are brothers and sisters back east, and so we try to maintain uh, that relationship. We come back east all the time to go to Cherokee, uh, North Carolina. It's a beautiful country. You just get that feeling when you're there. Um, you know, these are our homelands back here, back east. When we look at these mountains, um, surrounded by all of these streams. It's uh, and rivers. It's seeing all of this stuff on a map sometimes and reading about it in history. And then when you're able to go to some of these places that our ancestors uh, had, had such a strong connection to, it's 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 it can get very emotional for us when we when we come back east and see some of these areas. Thank you. Really great explanation. Great elaboration. Something that we talked about by phone, uh, Catherine, prior to your visit was um, the pervasiveness of of people um, uh, wanting to claim their Cherokee ancestry, and there's sort of the the myth that's often used in by comedians and so on that uh, my grandmother was a Cherokee princess, or someone thinks that um, they misunderstand the difference between mm -hmm. having ancestry and and having the qualifications for citizenship in the Cherokee Nation as a sovereign nation. Would you would you kind mm -hmm. of spell that out, please? I think that's important for our Zoom audience and for people in here um, to know you know how the Cherokee Nation views these issues. So every, we get it more than any other tribe. I mean, everybody claims Cherokee uh, more so than any other tribe. Um, we are the best documented of any Indian tribe um, in the United States. I would argue that um, to anybody. We, I work with genealogists. Um, I work at the Cherokee National Research Center and we have our genealogy department right there. Uh, you know, we never had a Cherokee princess. I've, I've looked into where does this come from? Where does this myth of a Cherokee princess come from? My only guess is that when we started trading and started having this treaty relationship with the British, they do designate one of our um, one of our chiefs as emperor of the Cherokees. Um, there's a I really don't know where it comes from, and it's always a Cherokee princess. I don't know what happens to grandpa in any of this because grandpa grandpa is never mentioned. It's always grandmother, um, and I, and I don't, I'm not sure if that has to go you know hand in hand with the matrilineal clan system. It becomes a huge issue though for the Cherokee people. You know, there's three federally recognized tribes. Um, I forget how many, just in the state of Arkansas, I know there's dozens um, as, as far as some of these fraudulent groups. And it's something that, you know, we've had a task force in the past. We've, we've worked to, um, you know, make it aware we, we have some of our own citizens who have taken up and created organizations to try to combat that. And it's something that we deal with um, a lot. Now, yes, there are people that have Cherokee ancestry that cannot be citizens of the Cherokee Nation today, but they are also documented. And so, again, this goes back to early 1800s. We started not only documenting ourselves, but there's government censuses. Um, all of those censuses and all of those roles, those are usually attached to payments. And what usually is happening is that people are coming in trying to claim Cherokee citizenship when they actually weren't. That happened even to us during uh, statehood and allotment. So we use the Dawes final role as our basis for uh, tribal citizenship today. Uh, when they opened that up and we invited all of our, you know, anybody who had left during the Civil War, uh, during the gold rush, anybody who had went west, they had 10 years to come back to the Cherokee Nation 
to you know come back home, reunite with their families, um, you know get their 160 acres or 80 acres or whatever they were going to receive. And uh, again, they had 10 years to do this. And what this did was this influx of people coming into the five tribes and seeking, you know, citizenship. It, we became overwhelmed, and we actually had to to throw the first, you know, the first one out. So that's why you'll see a doll's roll, and then you'll see a doll's final final roll, which is how we determine citizenship today. Um, but again, we know there are people out there that have Cherokee ancestry. Um, I used John Rich. You saw a picture of him earlier. Uh, I used his descendants as an example. His son, John Rollin Ridge, because things got so bad during this Cherokee Civil War, John Ridge was brutally killed and the mother took the children and went, went to Missouri. His son, John Rollin Ridge, who was a baby when he was killed, when his father was killed, he goes out west. He ends up becoming a, a well-known novelist. Um, you know, he's buried out in Sacramento. His descendants today cannot be citizens of the Cherokee Nation because he never came home and enrolled during this process. But we also know that he's Cherokee. I mean, his family is is all over, is 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 involved in the Cherokee Nation for you know decades before this. So he has all of these ties. Not only just him, but some of his descendants that can't be citizens today you know they have uncles or aunts or other distant relatives who are on that Dawes role so somewhere there's always going to be that connection i always joke that cherokees are descended from the same five uh, cherokee people in history because we all go back to downings or foremans or um you know we're all nancy ward descendants i mean there's uh there's a ton of us there's tens of thousands of us uh, nancy ward descendants that are out there today um but again it's it's you know, the documentation, and I get people get frustrated when they hear about, you know, they can't find that documentation. Um, when they were enrolling our people for, you know, prior to Oklahoma statehood, uh, we had a huge resistance, you know, Nighthawk Katuas, um, you know, there was all of these movements in some of these different tribes uh, to resist allotment because we didn't want to have that individual ownership of land. We didn't want the tribe to be broken up. What the Dawes Commission did was actually send field agents out, and they were paid to, just in the Cherokee Nation, there was over 15 field offices. And what they did was pay these people to go out and enroll families who were resisting allotment. I've spoken with a number of our genealogists to say, okay, how many people were missed during allotment? You know, because we have all these people that come in that claim that their ancestors refused to enroll. For the most part, they got everybody. The ones that were often missed were spouses. So sometimes the blood quantum is off on those descendants today, but for the most part, they got everybody. I have so many of my family or friends whose family members were enrolled by neighbors or distant relatives. Um, again, they were paying people to to go out and, and find these, these individuals who were resisting allotment. The problem was is that there are actually people on the rolls who shouldn't be there. And I'm pointing to our governor of Oklahoma right now specifically. Um, probably shouldn't bring him up in this setting, but <laughs> his family actually bribed the Dawes Commission. And the Dawes Commission spent, or the Cherokee Nation spent a long time trying to get his family off the rolls. Um, but today we have Governor Stitt, again, the, the governor of Oklahoma, whose family bribed the state of, or bribed the Cher or the Dawes Commission to get on the Cherokee Nation rolls. And so he has no Cherokee by blood, but again, we use the Dawes final role to determine citizenship. It's got some flaws in it, but if we open up the door to kick one person out or let some other person in, then it just opens the floodgates for everything else. So, um, you know, we have to allow that to stand, you know, even as frustrated as we get sometimes, because if you're not aware out here in West Virginia, Cherokee Nation and Governor Stitt do not get along. So um, our principal chief and, and the governor are constantly in the headlines back home, uh, you know, going at it with each other, so. Thank you. You're giving us some really great explanations, and these are common questions that come up around here, and uh, students and people that I that I meet, and the rest of us in Native American studies meet. There are often this this connection. People do want to connect to their native heritage, and they do want to um, trace the the path of their Cherokee lineage and so on, and find it very challenging. But since you you brought the topic up of some people being left off and some people coming in, do you want to synopsize the Cherokee Freedmen situation? because I know that um, you know different things have happened over time in the last let's say 15 years and maybe you could bring us up to date in a nutshell yeah so 
With the Treaty of 1866, after the American Civil War ended, uh, Cherokees, we, in our treaty, the, our freedmen were given the same rights as native Cherokee. So how you interpret that over the years has been you know, up for debate <clears throat> a few times. We did have freedmen who were uh, held counsel during the 1880s and 1890s. And so um, you know, it was something that when you look historically at some of the newspapers and some of the documentation, there was resistance against it a little bit then. They were trying to, what did that, what does that 1866 treaty and those specific words, how do you interpret that? All the same rights as native Cherokee. Um, everybody, you know, a lot of people take that as them getting all of the same rights, being able to run for office, um, you know, not only just health care and services and things like that, but um, being able to run for our tribal offices. And so it was something that if you were familiar with our, you know, we in the news a little bit about 10, 20 years ago, uh, there was a vote to not allow freedmen in the, the descendants of freedmen in the tribe. Uh, this big Supreme Court case, you know, it's something that I forget how many tens of millions of dollars Cherokee Nation, you know, spent going through all of that. Um, one of the things I'm proud of, especially with this administration and Principal Chief uh, Chuck Hoskin Jr. is um, the embracing of the descendants of, of freedmen. Uh, when you look at their history and you look at how the Dawes role was done and the Dawes Commission was determining who was going to end up on that by blood role or that Cherokee freedman role, um, a lot of times they would just look at people. So you'll have, you'll have ancestors, you'll have brothers and sisters, maybe the the wife married a black man, and she would automatically just be placed on this freedman role, even though she had a Cherokee mother and a black father. And so sometimes she would just be automatically placed on that freedman role, even though she had Cherokee ancestry and she had Cherokee blood. The way the Dawes Commission is determining blood quantum and I mean, it's again, they're just looking at somebody and say, well, you look about half. Well, if you look at my mother, my mother is my mother looks dark. My aunt to their full sisters, you know, one's got blue eyes and, and one doesn't. My oldest son looks more native than I do. So you can't just look at somebody and determine how much blood quantum they're going to have. I have a little red headed, you know, my my youngest son is has bright red hair and he's super fair skin. And so every time his friends meet me, they say, you don't even look like your mom, you know. And so you can't use that to determine, you know, the racial makeup of somebody. And we know that the history with the freedmen in our tribe, you know, they were, um, you know, some of it's bad. The fact that Cherokees allowed that institution of slavery, it's just something that I feel like we're now really starting to talk about as the Cherokee Nation. It's something that, you know, two decades ago, I don't know that we were really talking about you know, our, our history with slavery in the Cherokee Nation, but we've really tried to own it and talk more about it and confront it and have a real conversation about it. And um, we currently, we just closed it. It was a six to eight month exhibit that we had uh, in our Cherokee National History Museum in downtown Tahlequah, Cherokee Freedmen and the Path to Citizenship, because this is something that has been not only a fight for them just the past two decades, but they've been fighting for this really since the end of the Civil War. And so um, that's an exhibit that we have, a traveling exhibit it opened up at Tulsa, uh, University of Tulsa, and it'll be something that's traveling around the country um, with this with this right to free, or this right to citizenship um, for the Cherokee freedmen. So um, they have all the rights today. They want to run for office. Uh, we've eliminated that uh, by blood rule because the thing is, is when you in our constitution, as far as um, you know, being allowed to run for office and things like that, but. When you look at their ancestry, for the most part, a lot of them do have Cherokee blood in them. It's just how the Dawes Commission chose to to put them on one on one side or the other is um, it's when you look at the when you look at how many brothers and sisters and children and aunts and uncles that you know are all the same family and have that Cherokee connection, but they're put on a, a separate role just based on what they look like. Um, you know, that's, that was really the issue, but with, with it, it all stems really from the Dawes rolls. Thank you so much. We have a, another question here in the room and then some more online. Okay. okay with, oh, no, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, one of the things that I think is really important for uh, this generation is to make sure that we are being respectful and we understand um, there's a, there's a need to label or to, to say, is the, is the correct 
term indigenous people, Native Americans. Um, I'm from South Carolina and I was able to go to the Catawba Reservation. And one of the things that I remember from years ago is um, they were saying that for the first natives of America. So um, but a two part question. So what what is the term that is the best to describe um, your nation's people? The population. Yes. So I would encourage to always try to identify, you know, by their tribal nation, if you can. If you know somebody is is Delaware or Shawnee or Choctaw or Chickasaw, like always try to acknowledge that. And, you know, as far as what you're going to call them. Um, I've had this conversation with my grandmother because, again, she was a, a full blood Cherokee. And when I, I was like, Grandma, what do you want to be called? Do you want to be called American Indian, Native American, Indigenous person? And she's like, I'm an Indian. I'm a Cherokee Indian. And so, you know, I think you're going to get different answers based on who you ask because some of the older generation, because um, I've asked this question to a number of our elders, and a lot of them, you know, they grew up being called Indian. And I think that there's that attachment to it at this point. Um, I, I say native a lot. Um, you know, a lot of people prefer American Indian. Some people prefer Native American. It's, I, I really don't know that I can offer personally what a, um, what a correct answer with that is. Again, if you can call that person by their tribal affiliation, that's always the best answer. But I usually try to go with indigenous or native whenever I'm whenever I'm speaking about an indigenous population or, or native peoples. Thank you. Uh, so the, the original question was, do you feel as if we as a country are making any progress towards acknowledging the history of natives? I think so, but I think it's been, a, I think we've had to fight for it. I mean, natives had definitely had to fight for that recognition and to make sure that our history is being told. You know, there's a lot right now just with schools in different states and what's going to be taught, um, how that's going to be taught. Uh, with the state of Oklahoma, they're trying to, you know, they don't want to talk about this critical race theory and stuff. And it's like, how do you do that when we have Tulsa race riots right there? When you have the, the founding of the state of Oklahoma and what it was based off of was, you know, abolishing tribal governments. And we have to acknowledge that. And it's something that I feel like the tribal nations, I think it is getting better, but I think it's something that tribal nations have had to fight for, um, will continue to fight for. Yeah, I think we have two questions and a comment um, in, in, that came in through the Q&A. So first, um, somebody, uh, Luann Lancaster, wanted you to speak briefly about the significant impact Chief Wilma Mankiller had on the Cherokee Nation. I mean, I was always in awe of her. She was somebody that my grandmother was friends with, that my grandmother was a CHR, a community health representative in the 1970s and 80s. And Wilma was somebody that was from the community. Uh, she had gr grown up out in San Francisco because her family moved out there during to the, the relocation during the 1940s and 50s. But when she came back home, um, she was just Wilma to a lot of people. And then she becomes this celebrity. Uh, you know, she ends up on talk shows. She's given the you know, Medal of Medal of Honor. I got to meet uh, President Clinton before, and the whole time I talked to him, all he wanted to talk about was was Wilma, and um, I think she gave hope to, especially to females. She's huge for for women because she was our first and only female principal chief. And you know, I grew up in the 1980s, seeing her, seeing how relevant she was, seeing her presence, and. I don't think I ever questioned that I couldn't not do something like that for my people. And so I know that a lot of people don't have that as far as that woman leader that's able to, um, you know, be that icon for you. She was so down to earth. Uh, I worked closely with her daughter, um, uh, Gina Olai, who recently passed, uh, Jagesa. But, she, um, you know, going and sitting at a table with Wilma, and she's like, oh, you know, I'm going to invite mom along, or hey, do you want to go to lunch with mom or something? I'm like, yeah, I want to go to lunch with mom, you know, because it's Wilma, you know. And so I was always in awe of her, but if you ever had a chance to meet her, she was one of the most gracious, kind, humble, just, I mean, it was like speaking to just one of your relatives. And so um, just seeing how humble she stayed through all of her, um, all of her recognition, you know, now we have the Wilma Mankiller Quarter, 
and it's just um, she, she's huge for for us. And you know, people want to, everybody's going to have their faults. You know, there's sometimes as as historians, um, you know, just with history in general, sometimes we put people on these these pedestals, and you know, they're human and and they're going to make mistakes. And so, um, you know, there's there there's there's things like that that. You know, people try to bring to light and talk about and things like that. And I'm not trying to put her on this pedestal, but she was huge inspiration, especially for young Indigenous women, I feel like. Um, and we also had a comment from Karen Tate who wanted me to tell you Wado. And I please, uh, all right, <laughs> please uh, forgive my pronunciation if I mispronounce that, but she's learning the language. Oh, no, yeah. Um, and then Catherine Moore um, wanted to know more about. Overhill towns um, that were mentioned as having connections to what is now West Virginia. Um, it, that was from, she's referencing the original Cherokee territory and population map from your slide. And I think you'd mentioned that those folks living in the Overhill towns were the ones who would have been coming over more into West Virginia. So when I started looking at the history, so Oconestota, who was a, a Cherokee leader, um, it seems like he was pretty active around here. And so some of those overhill towns, which you look at that map, you know, they're over the, the Appalachian Mountains right there. And it just seems like when, from all the research that I've done, because I spent a few weeks, you know, trying to look through this, asking some, of, you know, some questions, asking our archivist, you know, what do we have on Cherokees in West Virginia? There's not a lot. I mean, it's a small section that we had here in West Virginia. It's just that small southwestern corner of West Virginia. And again, some of those were, I mean, these are beautiful, lush, you know, grounds for hunting and, and, and things like that. So I'm not super familiar with, you know, who all's coming over. I do know that Oconestota was active here. And again, he's a Cherokee leader, um, you know, very well, you know, beloved in the, in the Cherokee nation. There's a lot of people that uh, love to read the history of Oconestota. So I do know that he was active here, but Again, this is something that I have found when I visit places like this and I go back east and when I go to Eastern Tennessee and I meet historians there, you know, I'm, I'm learning so much just when I go and visit some of these places that, that I didn't know. Um, I'm ve very familiar with the territory of Oklahoma, of the removal routes, um, but again, yeah, West Virginia was kind of that, this was a spot for me that I didn't know a lot about. So I'm interested to learn more about the Cherokees and history and involvement here in West Virginia. And Wado is, thank you, in Cherokee. So a lot of our elders, my grandmother always pronounced it Wado, is how we would say it. So um, yeah, Wado, Wado. It's just, uh, you're going to have different dialects no matter where you go. It's something that varies community to community. Um, even back east, the different towns and the different regions had their kind of own little bit different dialects. And it's something that Eastern Band, Cherokees, United Ketua Band, you know, there's always a little bit difference. Um, in some of the language, but everybody still understands each other. I guess it's like having our, you know, Yankees talking to Southerners, right? Because I probably, I mean, I definitely have an ac Oklahoma accent, and so I get called out when I visit my friend from California or my friends in upstate New York. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, first of all, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, and uh, thank you for coming out here. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. Maybe this is a bit more personal. Um, I just wanted to say first, I really enjoyed what you had to say about, you know, uh, Cherokee history is a lot more than just kind of these low points when we talk about things like the, the removal era and things like that. You know, there's a lot more to Cherokee history. Um, and I suppose I wanted to ask you as a historian, um, do you have a favorite figure in Cherokee history or perhaps a favorite story that you like to tell as a historian that, that maybe excites you or you find any enjoyment in? Ned Christie, that's his name. So um, if you do any research on me, I'm, I love the outlaw lawman history of Cherokee Nation and Indian Territory. It was something that when I first got to Fort Smith National Historic Site, they hired me because I was Cherokee. Um, there were people who had volunteered for years there and I was basically given the job as a park ranger because I was Cherokee. So I knew I had to step up and learn that history quick. I was there to talk about the removal routes through Fort Smith. Um, all five tribes came through Fort Smith via the water route uh, during removal. And while I was there, what really prompted my interest in the outlaw and lawman history was that I started running across 
family names in the criminal case files. And so when I was researching for other programs. So if, you, if you're familiar with Judge Parker, True Grit, you know, that jurisdiction of that court, again, it had jurisdiction over non-Indians um, and their involvement in Indian territory. There's one individual in particular whose name is Ned Christie, who was a Cherokee counselor, uh, very popular. He was anti-allotment. He didn't want the railroads coming through Indian territory. He wanted the Cherokee Nation to govern its own affairs. He wanted the federal government out of all Cherokee affairs in Indian territory. So he's accused of killing a U.S. Deputy Marshal by the name of Dan Maples. And Christie had always maintained his innocence. Uh, Maples had been in Tahlequah, um, had some arrest warrants for a few people for whiskey. You know, whiskey was a, you know, alcohol. We had prohibition there in, in Indian Territory. And uh, so he was there to serve some warrants. Well, Ned becomes one of the main suspects in, Dan's, in, in Dan Maples' murder, um, mainly because he had been in the area, he had gotten some whiskey, he had passed out. And when he woke up he, the next morning, and he's there for a council meeting, he wakes up the next morning to find out that he's wanted for the murder of Deputy Maples. Um, he's told to go home and uh, hide out, basically. He spends almost five years hiding from the Fort Smith Marshals, and almost five years. And he never really left his home um, because he had the entire community, the entire Katua Society, which is the most traditional um, you know, segment of our, of our people, and they were all looking out for them. So the Great Bass Reeves, if you're familiar with Indian Territory history or any of that, there's a, a black lawman by the name of Bass Reeves. If you don't know him, you're going to, because uh, we just finished up consulting with Paramount Pictures, the Taylor Sheridan and that whole Yellowstone stuff. There's a 1883, and it's going to be over Bass Reeves. Uh, very famous lawman in Indian Territory. Uh, some say that he was the um, the inspiration for the Lone Ranger. And even Bass Reeves went after Ned Christie and was unable to apprehend him. And so after almost five years, a new marshal comes in. His name is Jacob Yose, and he thought this had gone on long enough. And so they take a uh, posse of over 30 men over a period of two days. They also bring a cannon from Kansas. And so they are going to get Ned out of his house. It's actually a very sad story, what happens, because they come down after almost two days. They are shooting projectiles, the cannon that shoots out what looks like those projectile bullets. Um, they end up blowing the cannon apart at one point, so they use the carriage, and they also had dynamite with them. So they take the dynamite and they roll it up to the home, and they're actually able to catch the house on fire. Um, Ned comes out, he's ran out of ammunition, he's shot and killed. Um, his body is actually tied to a cellar door and taken to Fort Smith, and he is propped up for the entire day. And people would come in and take pictures with the dead outlaw. Um, marshals posed with them, they put a gun in his hand, and very disrespectful how Ned was treated. And so that story just really hit home for me when I was working at Fort Smith because it never told the Cherokee side of things, why he was, um, you know, why he refused to go stand trial in a white man's court. Because that court in Fort Smith, uh, the men that sat on that jury were, were all white men. You know, today we have men, women, it's racially mixed. That was not the case back then. No natives wanted to go to Fort Smith to stand trial because it wasn't going to be a jury of their peers. And so they never told that side of the Ned Christie story for me. So I became very attached to that story. And I used to do a program every day at 2 p.m. about the real story of Ned Christie. There was a man that came forward in 1918, Richard Humphrey, and he did an interview with the Daily Oklahoman. And he said that he knew who had killed Dan Maples and that it was Bud Trainer who had actually killed him. But Dick Humphrey, Richard Humphrey was a Cherokee freedman so this is, you know, Jim Crow era. He didn't want to come forward, but Trainer's gang was was a pretty rough crowd, and so he waited until after Trainer died to come forward and give his interview in the Daily Oklahoman. Uh, we did do. I mentioned that TV show a little bit earlier. Uh, it's called OCO TV. Uh, o S I Y O dot TV, and the very first episode on the very first season we talked about Ned Christie. He's our sitting bull. He's, he's, he's our, um, 
you know, he's our Geronimo. He, he is that last great warrior who really stands up against the federal government and, and fights for a sovereign you know, Cherokee nation. And so we revere him in the Cherokee nation. Many people will call him an outlaw though. Um, and many people will attribute the murder of Dan Maples to Ned Christie. And my, my good friend, uh, my clan brother, Roy Hamilton Jagesa, he passed away a few years ago. He was a descendant of Ned Christie. We became very close. Um, back when I was a park ranger 20, over 20 years ago at Fort Smith and um, became very close. And I really felt like he helped change the narration and helped with the legacy of Ned Christie. I, I feel like there's going to be a movie, a documentary, something done on Ned one day. He's, he's, he's beautiful. He looks like the Indian Fabio anyway. So he's you know, nice looking as it, as it is, beautiful man. Um, when you see the images of him, if you Google Ned Christie Cherokee just right now, what first things you're gonna pull up is, you know, he's got short hair, he's tied to his cellar door and the marshals are around him. Um, the story just even behind him cutting his hair, the family story, you know, we don't want people to have our hair as natives. This is very sacred to us. And uh, he knew his time was about to run out. He was getting accused of all kinds of crimes in Indian territory, even for the murder of Bass Reeves who hadn't even died. There was a, a newspaper article out of Fort Smith that said, Ned Christie had killed the great Bass Reeves. And uh, about two weeks later, the newspaper says, Bass, came, you know, Bass is alive and well. He showed up in town today with 15 prisoners in tow. And so it just shows you everything that Ned was being accused of. And so he cuts his hair, him and his wife, and they bury it. And it's about two to three weeks later that the marshals show up and, and he's, um, he's killed. But almost five years, he's able to elude deputy marshals. Um, he's buried there just outside of Tahlequah. The uh, remnants of his fort and all of that are there. And um, I just think he's a phenomenal story. Again, I love the outlaw lawman history of Y'all have to shut me up because I'll sit up here all day and tell outlaw stories. We want to talk about the stars. You, we want to talk about the Daltons. Like we'll talk about all of it. So. Well, we're hoping that <laughs> our guests will um, kind of fan out for our, our lunch that we take, so that that you can uh, visit with other folks who are here today and and so on. You don't have to stay with uh, just the table of leaders. And I I know there are people in the room who would appreciate the chance to visit with you. You have to let everyone eat, though. Of course, you can't occupy them the whole time with questions and conversation but Catherine thank you so much really really appreciate so I say what and uh, appreciate you I, I remember uh, if I would call the um, Eastern Band of Cherokee office or the Museum of the Cherokee Indian it was always she oh you know this deep voice is saying hello but at Cherokee Nation it's the s sound is that right do I have that just reverse seal oh so, so OCO, OCO is how we say hello but then there's the uh, shortened version of CO mm -hmm. so it's kind of like hello and hi but so. I meant the S versus the SH sound when you were talking oh, about Shio. dialects. Oh, or, Shio. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's mm -hmm. a difference. And so yeah. just even with Wadon, like, I, I don't think that that's native. For, I mean, Muskogee Creek's right beside us, say, you know, Mado. So mm -hmm. I think maybe there's some connection there with, with those two. Well, thank you. Let's have a nice round of applause for Catherine. <laughs>